it's the big one. This is my Christmas video. And yeah, you guys know I'm a big Christmas buff. And it's time to talk about my favorite Christmas film of all time. Ba da da da. Batman fucking returns. Yeah, uh, I'm wearing this old ass vintage shirt here. Uh, this shirt is from like 1991. Well, at least that's when it was made. I know that the movie came out in 92, but still. This is a big one here. Um, everyone knows my favorite Christmas film is Batman Returns. Hands down, best Batman film, best Christmas film ever. It's dark, it's disturbing, and it gets a breakthrough through almost all the villains. Now, <clears throat> I'm hoping most fans are more into, say, watching, you know, the movie. They've seen the movie maybe a lot, maybe not so much, I don't know. But I'm going to be doing the history of Batman Returns. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to talk a little bit about the movie, the movies being made, and of course, the McDonald's scandal that went on right after the film was put to theaters. I mean, this was crazy. This movie has an insane history, but to me, it redefined the entire comic book franchise of films. So, here we go. A short history of Batman Returns. Let's get things started and let's start retrospectiving this shit. Let's hit it! Right now at Taco Bell, you can collect free Batman cops, like a free Batmobile cop. Or a free Batwing cop. The best way to get started with this film is to talk about, well, the history of the original 1989 Batman. Now, I'm only going to go through this briefly. This movie came out, and a lot of people thought that they were going to hate this film because of their casting choice for Batman. In fact, um, people were pretty pissed off with how Robin Williams was treated. A little fun fact. The entire reason that uh, Tim Burton himself offered the role to Robin Williams to play the Joker was actually bait so Jack Nicholson would come back and take over the role as Joker. Jack was basically his first and only choice. Of course, Robin Williams, the great late Robin Williams, would have been a great Joker, but I honestly don't think the Joker that we got was really well suited for him. This Joker is a much larger and darker take than I think Williams could give us. However, Williams has been known to do some really great films at the time, like, well, Insomnia or One Hour Photo or stuff like that. But this was at the... 80s Robin Williams. The Robin Williams who was silly, goofy, off the set of Popeye and Mork and Mindy and stuff like that. This was the comedic, foil, hilarious Robin Williams. And of course Tim Burton gives him the offer of playing Joker, which Robin Williams definitely wanted, just so Nicholson could come back and take the role. I'm getting off track and talking about the 89 film, but this does have a lot to do with Batman Returns as well process of being made anyhow however yeah this one was a big deal when it came out first there was petitions that were out over michael keaton playing batman and my thoughts of michael keaton being batman is he's the best batman we've ever had yes i know a lot of people love the late great kevin conroy or adam west or well even some people who like to dive in the dumpster with christian bale but Michael Keaton was able to capture the attitude, the atmosphere, the characterization of Batman. I think no one could really get the close of his physical acting and the way he's able to play diverse characters the way Keaton could. If you saw Beetlejuice, like I said, he's able to really give a double character dynamic, which he does great here. As Batman, he's dark, brooding, and intimidating. As Bruce Wayne, he's sly and unassuming. A lot of people really hated the fact that he was going to be Batman when it was announced. Now, I wasn't alive in the mid or late 80s. Hell, I wasn't around until 1991. So, yeah, I'm an old dog. But I still remember 
my parents telling me, or my grandfather, who is a, or was a huge Batman fan, telling me a lot of people hated Michael Keaton. But when the movie came out, everybody shut their mouth. Which gave us an entire thing of marketing. Batman was huge in the resale toy value. The toys were everywhere. People were buying them. Hell, Taco Bell opened up a line just to get to be able to sell products like shirts or cups or anything like that. This was huge. It brought Taco Bell a lot of money and it brought store chains like Toys R Us and Walmart or any kind of toy store any amount of money. This was huge for the Batman films. This was probably one of the biggest comic book films ever made in the history of comic films. It set the standard for superhero films. If there was no Batman 1989, there would be no Sam Raimi Spider-Man, there would be no Marvel Cinematic Universe, there would be nothing like this. There wouldn't even be Batman Begins or Dark Knight Rises. And maybe there wouldn't have been a Batman and Robin, but I digress on that. I'll go into those histories sometime later. This was enormous. The toys, everything was selling out. And of course, the movie was fantastic on its own with top-notch acting from Nicholson, Keaton, and Kim Bassinger. Several people loved the performances in this film. And it was going to originally be a standalone film because Tim Burton is not a sequel person. Well, back in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, he was not a sequel person. However, this movie did so well, New Line was pressuring him to make another Batman film, which would not come to fruition until the year 1992, and it would not be announced until 1991. But this one, of uh, the original Batman film, had such high market value. Kids and adults could watch this. Hell, I watch it every October, and then I start Batman Returns every December. So, yeah, this one is definitely a big piece of pop culture history. It's gigantically big. This one, just enormous, like I'm saying. I keep going on and on about it, but people don't really get how important this film actually is. And me saying Batman Returns is my favorite, I still owe everything to the 89 film. Tim Burton's dark touch and everything was able to give this such spectacular beauty. Of course, he was being pressured for a sequel, and he didn't have much creative control in the first movie. So when Batman Returns came around, he said he would do the sequel, but he wanted complete creative control. Which is exactly what he got. Complete and utter control. And of course, for people who have seen the movie, or if you're like one of the people who were like me and seen it when they were really little, you would be pretty disturbed. But if you know Tim Burton's history on his disturbing films or awkward or, e or eccentric films, you would definitely know if he has creative control, things are about to hit the fan. However, let's move on to Batman Returns now. I've been down here too long. It's time for me to ascend. From the sewers of Gotham, a new villain emerges. Here we are with Batman Returns. Now, remember when I said that the product placement for 89 was just crazy like nothing else before? The product placement for Batman Returns was going crazy months before it was even in theaters. No, not even months, maybe like almost a year before it was even in theaters. It was announced in 91. Now, with Burton in the chair and getting complete control, he was able to do exactly what he wanted with the story. Starting with the script, he was going to revision the Penguin. But what we had with the Penguin was basically Burgess Meredith's character. And for anyone who knows who doesn't know who Burgess Meredith is, he was the coach in Rocky and a few other things, but I mainly know him as the Penguin. However, Burton wanted to re-envision the Penguin, and all we had from the 60s version of Batman was, well, he was a rich, proper, tycoon, 
aristocratic character who loved money and the finer things in life, but he was a criminal. And yeah, that's about all we had. And we didn't really know all that much about him. So Burton took control of the script and slapped it across and made Penguin be played by Danny DeVito. However, Danny DeVito, who is a childhood friend of Jack Nicholson, Nicholson was the one who gave him the idea to be in the Batman series. That's the rumor, anyhow. I'm not sure if that's uh, confirmed or not. But anyhow, with him and Nicholson being childhood friends, Nicholson's career was kind of skyrocketing at the point because of the movie. So Danny DeVito was picked to play, well, the Penguin. And it was a complete touch-up with makeup and everything completely different than what audiences have seen of the 60s Penguin. He was disgusting looking, hideous, you know, a horrifyingly looking creature. And they really nailed the whole disgusting aspect of this character. Uh, a fish person with flippers and a disgusting deformed face, long nose, definitely out of DeVito's comfort realm of playing characters like his character on Taxi. This was a whole different ballpark. However, DeVito took to it like a fish to water, and he probably plays the best version of the Penguin. There was also some other fun things that happened to be with the Catwoman, but uh, let me talk about the Penguin first. Originally, this was written with basically Max Shrek and Penguin, Max Shrek being played by Christopher Walken, to be the Penguin's brother. So this is where they actually got the idea of Penguin wanting to kill all the firstborn sons of Gotham. Yeah, the film is pretty fucking dark because his second born brother actually got to be the respected business tycoon and Penguin himself was thrown into the dump or thrown into the sewers and treated like garbage. But they kind of cut that in the script for unknown reasons, I guess because the movie had a lot going on with its three villains. A lot of people say that there are two villains in this film, but no, there are three. And they are Penguin, Max Shrek, and Catwoman. And if you ask me, each villain actually symbolizes a version of the main character of Batman. Uh, there's Catwoman who symbolizes how Batman is on the edge of fighting for revenge and fighting because he wants justice. He's in the middle of that, the same split down the middle. The only difference is Selina is actually trying to kill and blow up people. Then there is Max Shrek, the corrupt businessman. He doesn't stand in the middle, but this is what Bruce Wayne himself could be. A corrupt businessman that always often believes there's no such thing as too much power, a line used in the film himself. Interesting enough, then there's the Penguin, who is the monster that Batman himself is portrayed to be. And it even says so in the finished movie product that you're just jealous because you have to wear a mask, and he's not a real freak like the rest of us. And Batman actually agreeing, you're probably right. I love those little details in the lines. A lot of people say that the real villain was the Penguin, but I completely disagree with this. The real villain is Max Shrek. Pure evil businessman. He made Catwoman. He basically manipulated the Penguin. And he was a swift businessman with more power than possibly Bruce Wayne. It was a very interesting concept. But, however, they had so much cramped in that they had to take the elements of Penguin and Max being brothers out of the film. Which, I don't know, I think this would have gave the movie a lot more edge, but I'm happy with what I got. We got an incredible Michelle Pfeiffer, Danny DeVito, and Christopher Walken performance. And as any of you guys know, this is my favorite Christopher Walken performance of all time. So, yeah. This one, I'm mainly just going to talk about the history of, basically, Max Shrek and the Penguin here. Their dichotomy is very interesting. Their ideologies are very similar. I like how in an interview, Christopher Walken himself actually said that, in a weird way, the Penguin and Max actually enjoy each other's company a lot more because Max is probably more sheltered than you think. 
he doesn't get out and he's not well educated and he kind of sees a version of himself in the penguin i like that a lot and i do really wish they had kept the version of well them being brothers unfortunately they didn't and it was kind of a miscast thing but the movie still works regardless but there is some messes messes up here especially with the penguin wanting to drown all the firstborn sons of gotham i mean you get why he wants to do it they also want to make the penguin a lot more tragic here now i'm getting off completely i gotta get back onto it i'm talking about the script changes now we're gonna go moving onward to catwoman's history here of course now we have the history of catwoman in this version personally if anyone's gonna ask me my favorite catwoman out of all the casting choices is Halle Berry. Just, just kidding. I'm really just kidding. Eartha Kid is my favorite Catwoman. There was just something about her voice and the way she moved that kind of just escalated and captured movements of a cat. She was definitely a cat-like woman. A very, very awesome. You know, this makes me wonder. People really got upset with uh, race changes and stuff. I wonder how nowadays how they would feel or i wonder back in the 60s how it was when they changed out catwoman for eartha kit me i think she's the best catwoman we've ever gotten on screen personally because she's just kind of born to play this role anyhow getting back onto the catwoman subject catwoman was definitely a big big deal for many actors and actresses in fact one former actress Sean Young, who a lot of people may know as Lieutenant Einhorn slash Ray Finkel from Ace Ventura, and of course Blade Runner, showed up dressed as Catwoman at Tim Burton's trailer. That was her audition. She showed up dressed as Catwoman. How insane do you have to be, or how much of a fan do you have to be to come play the part? And fittingly, I think she might have worked as Catwoman, honestly. She desperately wanted the part. However, the part finally went to Michelle Pfeiffer, who may not be the best Catwoman, but she is definitely in the top three. My second favorite Catwoman of all time. She was able to give so much to her performance as Selena Kyle at the beginning. She's timid and weak. And of course, as Catwoman, she is just crazy. You really don't know what she wants, but she's starving for vengeance. However, yeah, this one was just a fantastic choice. However, here's the thing. Michelle Pfeiffer was originally going to play Vicki Vale in the 89 Batman, but Michael Keaton wasn't comfortable with it because him and Michelle were dating at the time. Here, their relationship, I believe, had ended, and she got the role as Catwoman, and that's probably why their on-screen chemistry actually freaking worked. They were a couple before, and man... I've got to say, Selena and Bruce have the best chemistry out of the entire film. Out of all the Batman love interests, other than the animated series Andrea Beaumont and Bruce Wayne, this one just nails it. They are both mysterious, and they are definitely two different sides of Batman slash Catwoman, and they capture their personalities really really well i mean it, it's a really good personality clash between the two they're so alike they're so similar split down the middle and a lot of this hinges on michelle pfeiffer's performance this was a big deal getting to play catwoman and i really think that michelle pfeiffer just pulls this off so well now i'm not 100 percent sure the history on it but there were a lot of Catwoman additions, like I said with Sean Young, and many people wanted it. And hell, even Kim Basinger wanted to play Catwoman herself, but she decided to not come back for the role as Vicki Vale or anything. So they had the relationship in, which could start Selena, Kyle, and Bruce's relationship, which just kind of clashed as so much better. Not that I dislike Vicki Vale or Kim Basinger's performance, but there's not a lot to Vicki when it came to her personality and love interest with Bruce. But however, I would still support her love interest more so than Katie Holmes and Christian Bale or Maggie Gyllenhaal and Christian Bale, which why they switched them out, I, I have no idea. 
but we're not talking about Nolan's trilogies. This Michelle Pfeiffer really changed the way people portrayed and looked at Catwoman. Most of the time, she's a cat burglar. That's her thing, especially in the 60s version and even in the cartoons incarnation later on. Michelle Pfeiffer made her a revenge, thirsty, crazy person, and it just worked. She redefined the character. The character is so ready. It's kind of like taking the Punisher and throwing Catwoman in the blender, and that's basically Michelle's character. She captured Catwoman and redefined her in so many ways, making her a very interesting love interest for Bruce and Batman at the same time. In fact, you could kind of feel the sexual tension every time they fight on screen. I kind of just love all of it, especially one of my favorite scenes being when Batman is digging out one of her little tools that she puts in her suit, and he's like, meow. Man, that was just fantastic. One of my favorite moments in this film is probably when they are first fighting together and she makes the comment, well, Batman makes the comment, mistletoe can be deadly even if you eat it. And, of course, Catwoman replies, mistletoe can be even deadlier if you, or a kiss can be even deadlier if you mean it. Sorry about that, guys. I'm talking fast here. It's just great. Because that moment comes back later on and it's subtly revealed how they find out their personalities. And throughout most of it, most of their scenes are them fighting and constantly ready to fight and kill each other. But yet, Batman wants to change her. I love these little details that are in the film. In fact, most of their scenes are just enjoyable. But to me, the winning victor of this film, the entire film, is Max Shrek who just nailed it. Now that I got done explaining most of the plot and the history portions of this movie, now we're going to get into, well, of course, not the characters anymore. Let's go to the product placement and toys of what was with this film. What made it so much different than the 1989 film. And yeah, let's go. Let's move on. Frisbee Bat Disc Lids, straight from the movie. You can pick up a large drink in one of six Super Boy Collector Cups for 39 cents more when you buy any extra value meal or extra value pasta dinner because what you want is what you get at McDonald's today. Meow. I was saying in 89, this movie was definitely a big thing. When the trailer came out or when it was announced, people were everywhere. McDonald's decided to quickly go in and grab the food chain. They wanted Happy Meals, Cups. They wanted to beat Taco Bell's ass. The product placement was crazy in this one. There were so many uh, shirts released. In fact, the shirt I was just wearing in the video you guys see me opening up is a vintage shirt from 1991. Everything about this film was going huge. There was so much being jammed into it. And basically toys were everywhere. McDonald's had a toy lineup then Walmart, Toys R Us, everything. This time, it was twice as big as the 89 film. And, of course, Tim Burton, being Tim Burton, wanted to put a Christmas theme around this film, too. Yet he released the movie in the summer, so I don't know why. I think, I think he was trying to release it in December, but it was pushed for summer releases to sell more toys. Anyway... Yeah, this was huge. The McDonald Cups, I actually do have a few of. And yeah, I actually collect them all. One of them is straight from childhood. I have it straight from childhood. I break it out and I drink out of it every Christmas. In fact, I have a custom-made tumbler that I just had made so I could use it around the holidays. Like, uh, my grandfather had a Wally's World mug from... I'm getting off track. Sorry. Anyhow, this one was huge. I mean, the shirts, there were so many Batman Returns shirts. The comic book styles, everything about these shirts were just selling like crazy. Target had sales of it. Uh, the the freaking, the Kmart, Walmart, uh, Toys R Us, everywhere you could look, there was just Batman shirts, Batman Returns shirts everywhere. The original Batman film from 89 didn't have that much shirt product placements. 
In fact, all you could really find from them is if you bought the shirt from Taco Bell from 1989, and it says Taco Bell on the side, and it's just the bat symbol with little Taco Bell signia on the side. I had that shirt too. Don't judge me. This was completely and utterly different. Products and everything wanted to get a hold of this. Toys were selling like crazy. Hell, they even made giant action figures, models, board games, books, kids' books of it. It was unbelievably everywhere. McDonald's quickly grabbed up the rights to it so they could sell it and put it all through their products. But when the film came out, things happened. This movie was very, very dark for 1992. And right after this, parents were pissed. There was a lot of blood, uh, death, a man getting his nose bit off. Or, well, not off, but he got it bit. Gushing blood. Uh, people being electrified. Catwoman and her sexual tension. Very dirty jokes. Um, the penguin groping young girls. It was just definitely a darker film than the very first film. And honestly, that's what I like about this film. Hell, me and my grandfather used to pop this in every November and watch it. So, what does that tell you? I had it on VHS which started to slow down after it hit the theaters mcdonald's quickly canceled their commercials their toy lineup and yeah it was just a big deal scandal which you know what now that batman owns mcdonald's michael keaton played in the founder as the guy from mcdonald's who ran at ray Kroc. it was just unbelievable and you could not believe it. Like, there were sitcoms, or not sitcoms, but there were just uh, like talk shows talking about how dark and brutal this film actually was. And for a 1992 film, yeah, it was pretty damn dark and gory. I mean, especially some innuendos, like Penguin saying, just the pussy I was looking for. And he is, of course, talking about Catwoman, who is a pussy cat. It, you know what innuendo he was insinuating there. It was just a very strange movie. But I'm going to talk about the McDonald's scandal. Now, as I was saying, McDonald's totally bought up the rights to sell this thing. And it was their biggest mistake. But you should see some of the stuff that they had for this film. I mean, the, the Happy Meal boxes looked amazing. The fry boxes were black. It was just so cool. And the cups... Man, I love these cups. They even have a Frisbee lid, which is just kind of odd now that I look at it in hindsight, but so cool. And if you bought these cups for like, I think 10 or $11 at the time, you could come in and get a refill with these cups. And I thought that was so cool. I only got to keep one cup and it had Batman on the cover, which I'm not going to complain at all. But I did buy the rest of the cups online many years later when I was in my early 20s because I love the film so much. Now, man, when McDonald's seen everything that happened and all the product placement that they went around to it, they had to cancel everything quickly. Basically, it wasn't the kids that were upset about this. It was parents. Now, the parents that were taking their kids to this and keep in mind, most of the kids that are going to the theater are either my age who, or older at the time. The parents of those kids were fans of probably the 1960s Batman with Adam West. Or, of course, the 89 film, which wasn't as dark as, well, this one was. And the parents started screaming, throwing fits, you know, boo-hoo, this and that, the film could have ruined my child. My child didn't need to see this film. Which McDonald's basically had to cancel this one. So this is like one of the first times cancel culture was used at a fast food restaurant before it was ever called cancel culture. This was just gigantic. McDonald's quickly ended the toy line and they kind of put the toys away and never brought them out again, even though there are many toys on sale, very cheap, including the cups, which are cheap. And I have the fry boxes too, which I bought just for Christmas decoration. Don't judge me. 
and they had to crash it, trash it quickly because so many parents were pissed off, picketing, throwing fits. I mean, there was no Twitter or X or whatever, or Facebook or anything back then. These parents were writing letters to McDonald's saying that this ruins your family-friendly image and you gotta fix this shit because this is not good. This, this, this is not what we want to take our family to to uh, go and eat at a restaurant where a man just bit off another man's nose, and yada, yada, yada. So basically, yeah, McDonald's quickly trashed it and they threw it out, saying that they would not do another Batman film again. And of course, they did. They lied, which like most companies do. You know, I have a feeling that Ray Kroc, you know, Michael Keaton's character just took that over. I, I'm going to make some McDonald's jokes because of this point. But yeah, this scandal was enormously big for McDonald's. And it really brought a lot of controversy. Now me, I love the film. Hell, uh, my grandfather even liked the film. And he was a fan of the 60s Batman. He said that he watched the 60s Batman when he was a uh, young adult. He said that he liked the take on Batman's character... And he liked the version of a darker, more silly Batman. My grandpa really read the comics, so he liked the darker comics. And it was kind of his thing. Him and, him and Batman were just basically how he and I would bond. We would talk a lot. My grandpa got me into the Batman films. In fact, uh, he bought Batman Returns for me as a birthday gift when I was about four years old. So, what can I say? I have a really strong love with this movie but anyhow yeah this just kind of pissed a lot of parents off and that wasn't the only thing that happened we got to go back to the talk show and talk about it after we get done here but yeah this was definitely a bad look for mcdonald's parents were pissed off and apparently you know if you're from my generation did this movie really scar you that much me I was maybe a year old when this came out, and I still have some of the stuff. And in fact, I watched the movie the first time when I was about three. How I felt about this film was, I don't know. You know, I had been watching the animated series at the time. So I already was used to the darker Batman concept, so it didn't have that much on me. But kids who are maybe older than me, or, well, adults who are older than me now... Did this movie scar you guys, or is it one of your favorite films too? Because to me, this is definitely Tim Burton on steroids. But this wasn't, like I said, the only thing that the movie had done. This really basically just started a whole other chain reaction of cancel-like culture deal going on here. After McDonald's canned it out, and etc., about a Two years later, they rebought the rights to Batman Forever when Joel Schumacher got the directing seat and they started selling the glasses of Batman Forever. Joel Schumacher promised to basically give a cleaner image and goofier image to more of the 60s Batman. And he would then again destroy Batman with Batman and Robin. But for me, I like Batman Forever a lot. I don't think it's a bad film. Batman and Robin is ass. That's, I really don't have a joke for that. It's just complete ass. But I kind of like some of the concepts. Leave hate for me in the comments, please. Anyhow, yeah. After this, there was just more going on here. So, let's go on to the talk show. So, Danny, what did you think of the movie? It was very violent. It was... A total attack against kids. The whole movie. Everything that... The talk show was where they had these kid credit, or whatever, talking about how the movie scarred them. And I've got to say, for kid critics, these kids can't act. Like, I think that you actually hear one kid say, Well, the movie was really dark, but, you know, I had to watch it twice. If the movie really scarred you that badly... Yeah, why would you watch it twice? That doesn't make any sense. Anyhow, this talk show was about how dark and brutal Batman Returns actually was. And yeah, it kind of worked for a while. But I think a lot of this was parents coaching their kids to 
basically say how evil the film was and how dark it was and everything. Roger and Ebert didn't even like this film that much, and I don't understand why, which they didn't like the 89 film, yet they liked Mask of the Phantasm. However, to me, this is probably the best Batman film done to date. I mean, no new film of the Batman has anything on this movie. But this one, yeah, it just had so much damn controversy behind it. Like, people were just disappointed with it, and parents were picketing. These parents back in the day were basically Karens. And if you know what a Karen is, you know what I'm talking about. They were offended by the film and etc. However, my grandfather loved the film, and hell, even my mom liked the film, and she's uptight about every fucking thing. But this talk show, it basically was trying to go to cancel Tim Burton's career. But if you ask me, this talk show basically improved Burton's career. How it did, it's hard to explain. But this skyrocketed Tim Burton as a director even more. He got a lot more free-range stuff. I mean, after this film came out, and it did successfully well. I mean, for its scarring people, people still talk about it and talk about how the Penguin and Danny DeVito was the best part, yet people wanted to cancel this film. And it also basically skyrocketed Burton's basically taking the front seat. I mean, after this film, Nightmare Before Christmas came out, and then, of course, other fun films of his came out way, way later, too. I mean, this guy started doing a lot of interesting stuff right afterwards. And it was pretty interesting on how well his career had taken off shortly after Batman Returns. I mean, we got movies like Corpse Bride and, of course, one of my personal favorites, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You know what? Before anyone says anything, yes, I love Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But he came up with his Burton-esque styles because of this movie. We got a taste of what Batman Returns was in Tim Burton's mind. And to me, yeah, this one just kind of nailed everything perfectly. This is Batman. We got a better, more seasoned performance of Batman. And the things I really enjoy with this film is it's just kind of hard to nail down on how good the movie really is. There is a lot to go through here. But anyhow, talk shows tried to cancel him. McDonald's was a big factor on why the movie didn't get redone. When he was working on the third film, the movie did not get done by him. That's why Joel Schumacher had to take the seat and poor Tim Burton was kicked out. But he was still giving ideas and etc. That's why we got Batman Forever with Val Kilmer, who to me is actually a really decent Batman who captures Batman really well. Yes, he's trying to copy Michael Keaton, but he's also trying to do his own thing. I think Val Kilmer is one of my favorite Batman, too. Um, also, on top of that, we got Tim Burton giving more advice, but then there were things that were changed in Batman Forever that doesn't make much sense. So, as you know, Harvey Dent was played by Billy D. Williams in the very first film, but I guess the chemical that spilled on him turned his face white and purple. So we got Tommy Lee Jones, which was a very interesting choice. Now, I probably will go into the history of Batman Forever eventually. But at this point, it's Batman Returns time. This was definitely what some people would say a wound for Burton. But if you ask me, this launched his career. This launched his director career and it showed how weird strange and disturbing Burton could get if he wanted to that's what made this film stand out more it was Batman but with so much Tim Burton slapped on all over it and it was dark and disturbing and that's why it's my favorite of the Batman films so many cancel cultures pissed off Karens and etc tried to stop this film and they didn't even want to get it on VHS even. But yet, it made it 
and it got a really good reception on VHS Home Life when parents weren't really trying to pick it and control what kids went to the theater to see. It definitely got revived in the home life on VHS. And the toy sales still sold really well. The shirt sales, even before the movie came out, sold amazingly well. I mean, I had three Batman Returns vintage shirts. One was given to me as a gift by someone that worked on the movie, and the other two I bought. And I paid a pretty penny for the other two. One of them being the purple one I was wearing was 60 bucks, and the other one that you guys see me wearing my profile picture, the black one from the cover of the film, being like 70 bucks. So, yeah. I, it, the movie shirts were everywhere, and they sold crazy. The toys sold crazy, and even McDonald's, before the movie was released, made a really good amount of money. It was just after the movie was released where they canceled everything. This was a big one. And when Joel Schumacher decided to take over for the third iteration of the Batman films, of this saga anyway, Michael Keaton pretty much said he is not going to work with Joel Schumacher because he was kind of destroying his version of Batman. And he trusted Tim Burton more so. And of course, Burton was really good friends uh, with Keaton at the time, too, if you watch Beetlejuice and etc. He also came back in his Dumbo movie. And, you know, Keaton is awesome. I've got to say, yeah, this is just an interesting history complex on the Batman movies. And what it did do, it did well to me. And it changed everything for me anyway. I love this film, and I honestly can't stop loving this film. It's amazing. To me, this is Batman's dark, brooding nature mixed with Tim Burton's craziness. If it wasn't for this film, I honestly believe we wouldn't have got the animated series' take on the Penguin or anything like that. Same goes for the 89 film. Both these films brought comic book movies to life. I mean... After the Batman movie was done, the Ninja Turtle movie came out in 1990. I mean, 89, the Batman film came out, and then the Ninja Turtle one was right after. Think about that. And it was a much darker take than the cartoon gave us. Then, shortly after that, Batman the Animated Series came out. And they kept that style of Batman being dark and brooding because of Tim Burton's touch. And... I guess that's why I have to say on how interesting this film really is and how good it really is. There are rumors that um, Billy D. Williams was supposed to be in this, but I don't think so. I think they had Max Shrek's concept born from the start. <clears throat> Anyhow, I think that's about it for me. I really enjoyed talking about this film and its history and its complex history and publicity, but that's about it was my history of Batman Returns. You know, I had a lot to say, a lot more than I thought I would about this film. I mean, there is just so much going on that you can't help but love this film. I mean, anyhow, yeah, I finally got this done. Um, I wanted to do this actually last year around this time because, well, the movie always puts me in the Christmas spirit. You know, a movie where penguin bites the nose off somebody or you know um a man is electrified to death by catwoman's taser uh, you know definitely a very great christmas film <laughs> but i think what i love about this is it's unconventional christmas dark that it has that's what i really enjoy Anyhow, that about does it for this video. Um, should I do another retrospective history on the Batman films? Or if not, maybe I could do something afterwards. I'm not going to be posting for a little while after this. I'm going to be taking a little break. But I hope you guys enjoyed this. Anyhow, if you have any more suggestions for me to talk about Batman or anime or whatever, tell me in the comments. Always remember, I'm listening. Hello, this is Corey Feldman. Welcome to my studio here in Los Angeles, California. And I just wanted to pop in to say congratulations to Tim. Mr. Tim, I hope everybody's enjoying your videos. He's got some great content. And if you're enjoying his content, make sure you click on that little button right there that says subscribe. Why? Because everything on his channel is 
Bossa Nova. That's right. Congratulations on your channel, Mr. Tim. I'll be following you, and I know everybody else will, too. <laughs>